speaker is Stefan Roswak of Uni Stockholm University that gives a speech about neutron star mergers and heavy element production site. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation um, to this wonderful meeting. Um, I will talk about neutron star mergers as well the production site um, of the heavy elements, and you've heard some of these things to, with some aspects before. Maybe just starting from the beginning, um, neutron star mergers are, of course, wonderful topics for all kind of different physics and astrophysics questions. One starting point is, well, we know 15 binary systems, so that tells us already quite a lot um, about binary evolution, provides some constraints there. Then one of the reasons why we're all here is, of course, um, they're one of the major sources um, of gravitational waves and have now been detected um, directly for the first time. Already in the 60s, as um, Neil has, uh, sorry, in the 60s and the 80s, as Neil has mentioned, um, Bernard Schutz realized um, that you can actually use them to do cosmo cosmology as some type of a standard siren. Um, much of what we know about extreme nuclear matter properties are somewhat related to binary neutron stars and to their gravitational wave emission, for example, the maximum mass of the neutron stars. Um, we have heard from Zwi, um, they now we know they produce well, something um, of a short gamma ray burst and closely related to what I want to say here is um, they are relevant for nucleosynthesis and the stuff that we're talking about is what you see in these double peaks that I've indicated here as this R process. So these are the elements that we want to explain. And this is of course closely related to the elemental evolution of the cosmos and as has been realized also uh, more than a decade ago is if this is really true, then the radioactive decay of these elements will produce a transient. And uh, I think it's fair to say nature really has delivered last August. So all of these events, um, all of these different aspects have now been connected. And this is now really the start of truly multi-messenger um, astrophysics where one can learn properties of, for example, neutron stars sometimes from very unexpected directions. Now, just to start with the beginnings, so what we really want to explain, or what was the big question, um, are those rapid neutron capture elements shown here as this R process. And just to say, everything up to about the iron peak is done by Big Bang or stellar burning. If you're above the iron peak, you have essentially two neutron capture processes, a slow one and a rapid one. And um, the rapid one produces those peaks um, to the left. I mean, we're not just talking about a tiny set of exotic elements. We're really talking about something like 50% of the elements that are heavier than iron. And just some nice examples here are, of course, well, things like platinum or gold or lead, which are sitting in this um, last peak here at a nucleon number or mass number here of about 195. And that is therefore called the platinum peak very often. Now the question where it actually does happen um, has been really a, a puzzle for a very long time and we've been on the wrong track for a long time. And um, it's really, now many young people think, well, it's obvious that a neutron star merger would do this, but this has been really one of the 11 science questions for the new century from the National Research Council. And traditionally, it was just supernovae that were favored. And actually since the, um, since the seminal paper by Burbage et al. and by Cameron et al., um, from 57, and then um, Jim Latimer suggested in 74 that disrupting a neutron star, say in a neutron star black hole merger, um, would provide interesting conditions. The question was just how much mass is really actually flying out, and they tried to estimate this at this time without um, numerical simulations, and the answer was 5% plus minus 5% of a neutron star mass. And that means, well, if you're on the optimistic side, then of course this could be a very interesting thing. But on the pessimistic side, maybe not. Then um, there was this paper that we had uh, mentioned in 98 discussing neutron star mergers as a source of R process, neutrino bursts, um, and uh, gamma ray bursts. And then the first calculations. Um, of nucleosynthesis that are based on really a hydrodynamic simulation. They were coming in 98, so this was mainly work done together with, at that time, with another PhD student, Christian Freiburghaus, 
And um, we had a conference proceeding in May 98, which was called Coalescing Neutron Stars, a Solution to the R Process Problem. And one of the results, actually just two results, one of the results was the simulations show that the mass that is ejected is just enough to explain the R process that you need in the universe if you assume what was the best estimated event rate. The second major result here was the first nuclear synthesis calculation. I'm not sure you can actually see this. There are some crosses, which are the solar R process abundances, and the line is what we had calculated, and that was actually the first time that without any tuning, this platinum peak just emerged naturally, and this had never happened with core collapse supernovae. There, people had really to tune their models, increasing their entropies by factors of five or seven or so, and there, there was just no tuning. It just came out for free. As I said, this was May 98, conference proceeding, and we were both PhD students, Christian and myself, so it took us a while to write up the paper. Um, but Lee and Paczynski read this very carefully, and they just made the next step, and they said, well, if this is true, then you should expect an electromagnetic transient coming out of that. And that started the whole business now of macronovae or kilonovae, or however you want to call this. And there has been a lot of work and too much work to mention in the last decade on this. Now you can imagine, if you want to form heavy elements from neutron stars, there are lots of things that come into play. And one of the things that is actually the most crucial quantity is the so-called electron fraction. So this is the number of protons divided by the number of nucleons. And um, that has a decisive impact on where the nuclear synthesis is happening. I unfortunately don't have a pointer, but um, on the x-axis of this plot, you have the uh, neutron number. On the y-axis, you have the proton number. What you see in black, these are the stable elements. This is the value of beta stability. And you see this color-coded um, region. This is actually at the place which is called the neutron drip line, just because neutrons can drip out of the nuclei there. And the major effect of this electron fraction is, in one case, if the electron fraction is high, and high meaning something like 50%, so roughly the same number of protons and neutrons, then you're close to this value of beta stability. And if you're very neutron rich, you're at this drip line. So you're in a very exotic region of this nuclear chart here. Now, the major competitors for where the R process would take place were the supernovae and the neutron star mergers at some point. And they're coming essentially from two different sides. So the neutrons, uh, sorry, the supernova comes from a collapsing stellar core that does electron capture. So it starts from an electron fraction of about 0.5 and is deleptonizing, going to maybe an electron fraction of the order 0.3 while in the neutron star merger case, you're coming from the other side. You have cold, deleptonized neutron star matter, which has an extremely low electron fraction. And of course, if you slam the stars into each other, you can heat them up. You can, go, uh, you can undergo um, positron captures or neutrino absorptions, and that can change the electron fraction. But you're coming from the low end and approaching the higher end here. Now, um, a quite instructive exercise in this context of this observed macronova is to just start with a cold um, neutron star in beta equilibrium. And this is actually a very nice, well-defined initial condition. So you have spherically symmetric. If you assume you know the equation of state, I've chosen just one here, and then you solve your oppenheimer walkoff equation in beta equilibrium, then that tells you what the electron fraction is. And it tells you, well, throughout most of the star, it is something like maybe 7% or so, nearly dropping to zero close to the crust. And in the crust, you have higher values of the electron fraction. But if you look at the density, you also see at this place where this is happening, the density is dropping dramatically. And that means, in total, you don't have, you have hardly any mass in this high YE range. And I will come back um, to this critical YE value, which is shown here as the red line. This is about 0.25. And in the cold initial neutron star, the mass that you have with electron fraction above this critical value is something of the order 10 to the minus 5. It, value, it varies a little bit with the equation of state, but whatever you do, it's a very, very low number. Um, I've said the electron fraction is the crucial thing, and that means if we want to understand the nuclear synthesis, we need to understand what is happening in the merger in terms of positron captures and in terms of neutrino captures. And we need to know the history, and especially the thermal history, um, of the ejected material to understand where does this red stuff or the blue stuff come from. Now, another thing that is maybe a bit 
basic but worth stressing, and that is a neutron star is extremely tightly bound, of course, and if you're a nucleon sitting on the surface of a neutron star, you have a gravitational binding energy of the order 150 MeV per nucleon, which is, of course, way larger than anything that you could gain from nuclear burning or so. And that is maybe one of the reasons why the idea of, well, decompressing a neutron star has been met, met with some skepticism, just because it's not trivial to unbind um, such matter. But, of course, you can unbind it if you collide your neutron star with another neutron star or maybe with a black hole of a stellar mass. Now, um, there are different types of ejecta. If you throw out material, one part is called dynamic ejecta, and the major reason for the dynamic ejecta is it's being unbound on a time scale that is the dynamical time scale of the neutron star, which is a millisecond, which is, of course, an interesting number to keep in mind. And among those tidal ejecta, you have two different components. One is the tidal component, so this is what you would see roughly here in the spiral arms of the um, above plot. And this is essentially cold because matter just has no time and is expanding immediately. It's about a percent of a solar mass, and the electron fraction is extremely low. It's really something like 0.1 or actually even below that. Then you, once the neutron stars come into contact, you may have also in the polar region material that is coming out by a shock. But another somewhat basic um, statement, but important um, to make, I think, is it's not entirely trivial to shock neutron star material because the sound speed in a neutron star is nearly the speed of light, or at least a very substantial fraction of that. And if you have a very soft equation of state, then of course the stars get closer to each other, have a stronger radial velocity, the sound speed is lower. In that case, you have a higher chance to eject these polar material. And this polar material is substantially hotter than the other stuff, therefore it can have a different electron fraction and um, the mass is not so well known, but maybe it's also in the range of a percent or so. Now a second very different channel are so-called neutrino-driven winds. So if you look a little bit at this sketch here, the second one, if a neutron star survives the merger, then you have in the center, you have tens of MeVs of temperature, and that means you're producing neutrinos at a luminosity like a core collapse supernova. So something like 10 to the 53 ergs per second. And if you absorb some of the neutrinos in the remnant here, you just need to absorb, well, a couple of them. Then you have enough energy to leave the gravitational potential, and that can unbind some material, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And this could be also of the order of a percent, um, and a much broader range in electron fraction, which is important for the Makonova or Kilonova observations. The typical time scale here is, well, something like tens to hundreds of milliseconds, and then there is a last um, channel which has not yet been very well explored, but it may be actually very important. And this is once you have a black hole surrounded by an accretion torus, that will evolve. You transport angular momentum just to accrete matter, and this angular momentum transport also drives out material. At some point, you can have recombination of nucleons into alpha particles pumping in energy. The other thing is you have the magnetorotational instability at work. And this type of, um, well, engine has not yet been very well studied, but the best studies today, they show that a very large amount of material could actually become unbound, and something like 30 to 40% of the initial mass of that disk, and the disk mass could easily be, depending on the mass ratio of the stars, could be 10% of a solar mass. So 20 or, thir sorry, 30 or 40% of that. Another thing that makes this very challenging is the time scale. The time scale is a second or so for that, but if you want to model this, you have, of course, to take numerical time steps below the dynamical time scale, so tiny fractions of the millisecond. That's why these are very expensive calculations. Now, just to give you an idea about this tidal component um, of the dynamic ejector, this is a slightly asymmetric system of two neutron stars. What you see color-coded is the electron fraction, and I've chopped off the upper part of the stars so that you see what's happening inside of the stars. And you now see the lighter one gets tidally deformed, stretches, then forms a shear interface between the two stars. And then you see um, you shred the material into tidal arms and slightly asymmetric due to the mass ratio deviating from one. And the material that is flying out is this blue stuff. This is this tidal component that I'm talking about. And this tidal component um, is of the order of a, solar, uh, of a percent of a solar mass, and its electron fraction 
which is actually chopped off here. Um, this is something like 5% or so, just what I've shown before. It's essentially just sitting at its initial cold beta equilibrium value and flying out at about 20% of the speed of light. Now to fix the ideas about um, this other channel, these neutrino-driven winds. So this is an, an example from the PhD thesis of Albino Perego. And um, this starts from a simulation just like the one that you've seen before, but now focuses particularly on the neutrino physics, and in particular includes the heating from the neutrinos to the material. And um, it's showing a number of different panels. Let's maybe focus on the YE panel here. And you see the, what you see at zero, zero there, this is the original orbital plane. And if you now look at the electron fraction YE, you see you're driving out material towards the polar direction, and the color is yellowish, so this would be this um, color bar to the left, and the typical value of the electron fraction there is something like 0.3. But it's a broad range. It can actually up, go up to 0.4 and down to below, well, something like maybe 0.2 or so. But this is a very different type of material, different time scale, and in particular, different electron fraction, therefore undergoes a different nucleosynthesis. Now, if you look at the nucleosynthesis, so these are just two examples. The left one is just what I've shown first. So this is just a tidal component of the dynamic ejector. And it's a bit of a complicated movie. So you see on the one side, um, you see the current abundances. So these are these green mountains that you see on the right. You see the trajectory that we're talking about on the left. And you see where we are in the nuclear chart as color coded here. And please note, you go to the very, very heaviest elements. We were there in this region way above the value of beta stability. And, and the reason for that is this extremely low electron fraction. Now, in contrast, if you look at these neutrino-driven winds, then you see from the start, they don't start at the drip line, like the, the other case, and they don't go to this extremely heavy material. So they stay much closer to the value of beta stability here, and um, they don't decay back from the very heaviest ones, but just from intermediately massive nuclei, and you also see the green mountain type structures here also. This is the nucleosynthesis that results from this one, and that is very different from the one over here. So in this case, for the dynamic ejector, you have essentially just material above barium, so something like mass numbers above 130, while for this wind type material, you essentially don't produce anything in this very high mass regime. Just to rub this in a bit more, so this is resulting um, abundances, what you see as blue dots is the solar system R process abundance. What you see from all kind of different simulations um, is, is what is coming out of the calculations. And you see, well, the results do not depend, well, in hardly any way on the exact system that is merging. So this is extremely robust with respect to the astrophysics. You change the mass ratio, that doesn't change what comes out of this material. If you change the nuclear physics, it does do this. There are some parts which are not so well known, like fission fragment distributions. If you change this, it changes the pattern. But again, if you keep the nuclear physics fixed and you just change the astrophysics, it gives you a super robust pattern. And that is actually a very nice feature because many metal poor stars show exactly this pattern at this mass range. Now, if you, um, this is this critical value that I've mentioned. So we have something like 0.25 um, is a critical value for the electron fraction. Now, the winds are on the other side, and here you see um, a whole variety of different trajectories, and you see now the results depend on which trajectory you're looking at. So now the results are sensitive to exactly the part of the flow that you're kicking out, but whatever you do, you don't produce these very heaviest ones. You only produce masses below 130 or so. Now, one thing to notice is, well, if you actually add many of those with what you find here, then you're actually pretty close to the solar system abundance. And so this is nicely complementary um, nucleosynthesis. And there are also a couple of other systems that have looked at just following the torus evolution with various approximations around the black hole. And they've also found that you can produce actually the whole R process range um, from those black hole torus systems. Now coming to these radioactive decays. So in some sense, um, the signal that you expect is has some similarity to what you have in a type 1a supernova. So you have a cloud of radioactively expanding material, and you only see it because once the cloud becomes optically thin, you still have radioactivity left. Otherwise, you would have just transformed everything in PDV work, would have been cold, and you wouldn't see very much. 
But of course, the differences here are it's much less of a material, typical number, a percent of a solar mass, much higher velocities, and in particular, it has a very different composition from any other type of cosmic explosion that we are aware of. So supernovae would be down here, say with typical elements like magnesium um, or iron. Um, these winds that I've talked about, they're substantially heavier um, in this intermediate range, and these tidal components of the ejector, they're now producing the elements in this so-called platinum peak where you have then platinum and gold and uranium and these very heavy elements. Now, if you want to do a detailed modeling of this, it becomes actually pretty complicated, but you get actually astonishingly far with just simple estimates. And um, the zeroes order approximation is just, well, assume you have a homogeneous sphere, it has some mass, it is expanding freely with a given velocity, and it has some opacity, and for simplicity, you assume the opacity is constant. Um, then you can just calculate the optical depth, just in order of magnitudes, just the radius times kappa times rho. Then you know, well, the diffusion times is just the optical depth multiplied by r over c. And then you know from supernovae, you expect a peak to occur when the diffusion time is approximately the expansion time. And already from these very simple assumptions, that tells you a formula um, for when you would expect this stuff to peak. And from that, you can calculate something like a temperature in a sense that's just you're applying uh, Stefan Boltzmann law in this order of magnitude approximation. Then the only thing that is left that you need for this simple estimate is a measure for the opacities. And um, this has actually been done wrong for, well, one and a half decades. Um, people have used um, opacities close to what you use in supernovae of the order 0.1 square centimeter per gram or so, but the opacities are really set by the number densities of lines of the species that you have around. And this is just to illustrate the point. So here you see a typical iron type um, element uh, where you see the density of the lines, where here you have a heavy R process element which has a much, much higher density of lines, and therefore the opacities are something like a factor of 100 larger than in the, in the supernova case. Now, if you take this into account, again, in this simple estimate that you say, well, let's assume that's constant. Of course, in reality, that's more complicated than that. Then what you would expect would be, well, if you have material below 0.25, then you produce this very heavy R process stuff. That would mean you have the high opacity. And then just putting the estimates in the formula above, then you find, well, you would expect a red transient after about a week. If instead your material has a higher electron fraction, you have these lower opacities, and you expect a blue transient after about um, a day or so, so something different. Now, um, qualitatively, of course, initially, you expect this to rise as more matter becomes transparent. And then at some point, you're transparent. And then you would expect the lum luminosity that is falling off proportional to the mass that was in the ejector times the nuclear heating rate, which is this Q dot here. And that means you should see at some point the imprint of the nuclear physics in the decay of the light curve. As I've said, well, yeah, if, you, if you're happy with a somewhat cartoonish picture, then this nuclear heating rate just from network calculations would look like this. It's a, a roughly a constant for about a second, and then you have a power law decay with an exponent of something like minus 1.3 or so. And that means if you really want to do this carefully, then you do your best astrophysics, take your hydrodynamics with nuclear equation of state, neutrino transport, whatever. That gives you the mass, the velocity, and the electron fraction. But then to come to predictions, you still need the opacity, which means you need to do the atomic physics right. And given that in some of these elements, we're talking about hundreds of millions of line transitions, they're actually not very often known. And that is actually one of the major uncertainties here. And the last point is then, well, we need for the later decay here, we need the nuclear heating rate, which is also well known to some extent, but not entirely fantastic, because this is happening at a regime where we have to rely on theoretical models, and there are no experimental data for these type of nuclei. Now, you've heard this um, during the whole morning, so we were very, very happy, of course, to have this first multi-messenger event. And the punchline here is it actually started pretty close to the expectations after about a day. You saw a blue transient after about a week. That transformed after a couple of days. That transformed into a red transient, as you've heard before. And now you may wonder, well, um, yes, is this really our process? 
And this is, of course, a, an, an obvious question to ask. And there I've made a little experiment. I've just taken a little cloud of material and let it expand with different velocities um, and with different electron fractions. And what I'm um, monitoring is the radioactive heating rate. And what I've asked my observational colleagues um, to get is um, the observed um, bolometric luminosity. So this is all the observed electromagnetic radiation. This is what you see as those yellow coins. Um, then you can look at what the low electron fraction material will provide you. So these are either the black, the green, or the blue curves. And you see there's beautiful agreement with the observed bolometric luminosity and this material. And if you increase the YE further, then you see, well, that doesn't fit anymore. And um, there were also suggestions maybe a nickel wind could power this, this emission. This is what you see as the, as the blue pentagons, but that has nothing to do with the decay curve here. So it's very clear this is consistent with an electron fraction below 0.3, and this type of material does do our process. Um, yes, so um, one of the major lessons from that is, of course, if you were attentive, then you have realized that I was cheating a little bit. I was comparing two different things. One thing is the heating rate, which is energy per time and mass, while the other thing was the luminosity, which is just energy per time. And it means I need something like a mass scale to fix that plot here. And the mass scale that I've uh, used here is 1.5% of a solar mass. So what that tells us is if I make the extreme assumption that really every bit of the energy that is produced by the nuclear reactions is going into observable photons, then we need 1.5% of a solar mass. But that means in practice, we probably need multiples of this, maybe a, t a factor of two or three more than that. And this number alone tells you that this is at least a major R process production site in the universe. Now, if you go to a bit more model-dependent um, interpretations, this is after a figure from Perigo. You have these different um, ejector components, first the dynamic ejector, which is the first stuff flying out, and red. And in the polar regions, you have the blue stuff, and if you just look at what, the lit what, what um, people have published in the literature, you find for the blue stuff, you have something like, well, 2.5% of a solar mass. And for the red stuff, well, maybe twice that amount. But the blue stuff also has pretty high velocity, something like 25% of the speed of light or so. Now, one thing um, that is an obvious implication is um, it is very difficult just from this dynamic ejector alone to eject something like 4% of a solar mass. That is maybe with a really, really, really extreme mass ratio, but it's for sure not the best guess. For sure, a better guess would be of the order percent or so, maybe 2% in an extreme mass ratio case. And maybe that points us to the fact that we actually need this secular ejector, this torus that unbinds, because there's a large potential mass that can be unbound in this material. Now, the other thing um, that is worth stressing is in this blue component, I'd said this is the material that has an electron fraction above 0.25. This is of the order 2%. And uh, I told you in the initial neutron star, this is something like 10 to the minus 5. That tells us whatever has happened here, it was uh, for sure weak interactions were heavily at work and have raised to a substantial fraction of the material um, the electron fraction to, to above this critical value, which is then responsible for this blue component. Then the other, um, um, the other point stressing, but it has been stressed before also, is if you just look at if a typical mass is ejected, say 3%, and you take the best guesses for the rates, then what you would expect in terms of accumulated R process material in the galaxy is just pretty much the same number as that we have uh, that is observed in the galaxy. And that means very likely this is the source, or at least a major source, but very likely the major source of the heaviest elements in the universe. Now, maybe expressing another point, um, I had said um, the velocities in those blue components are 25 or 30 percent of the speed of light. And at least if you just look at the results from the neutrino driven winds, they would produce substantially lower velocities. So you may wonder, well, where may that come from? And Tzvi has also talked about this already partly. Of course, this is something like a type of cartoonish picture that you have the red stuff essentially in the orbital plane. In the polar region, you would expect the bluest stuff. But if you want to produce at the same time a GRB, then the GRB has to get out of that material. And um, this is just the first exploratory 
simple calculation of my new PhD student, um, Lorenzo Nativi. And what you see here is not a dialed up initial condition, but this is really the initial condition from the neutrino driven wind. And you're now shooting um, a jet through that. And what you see color coded is the electron fraction. And you see, of course, you have all these type of fluid instabilities pushing things out. And of course, nature will be much more complicated than just this cartoonish picture. Now then, coming to the end, well, what have we learned? I think uh, very much, first of all, um, the best understanding is it was a binary neutron star merger, 2.8 solar masses. So far, everything consistent with GR. Um, it allowed for an independent measure of the Hubble constant. It has told us something about how much you can deform neutron stars, tidal deformability, which again is a constraint on the nuclear matter equation of state. From the electromagnetic uh, waves, we have learned well where the host galaxy was. We have learned it produced a short GRB. We have um, from this time delay, we have wonderful constraints on the propagation speed of gravitational waves. And in particular here, well, it has produced this macronova or kilonova. And the punchline is really, it seems that neutron star mergers are at the very least a major source of the R process in the universe, but likely the dominating one. And also it does not just produce the heaviest, but it seems to produce the whole range. And of course, we are all interested to see well, how specific or how peculiar this event was, um, but I think we can be very um, well, we can be very happy that very soon LIGO will start working again and the uh, future is very bright in this field. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dean. Um, as I, as I, well, as um, Elena tried to explain also a bit earlier, say this neutrino driven wind is very sensitive to that. So if the central neutron star is collapsing, the neutrino driven wind will become much, much weaker. Um, in that sense, this component is very sensitive to it, but um, what you would then still have is a torus around the black hole. And there are not many calculations of that yet, but the first one suggests this would mainly produce red material, potentially some blue, um, but the punchline is that is not yet well explored. Since this is very expensive, it could actually also produce some of the blue component, but the neutrino driven wind component is for sure very sensitive to the lifetime of this central neutron star. That is, that is a, a very good point. Um, initially, at least, you have, um, you have an, an overlay of many, 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 many different isotopes. And if some of them are somewhat wrong, it may not be that dramatic. But um, it, it is actually a very interesting, um, there we are. It's actually um, a very interesting possibility that maybe we can actually learn from this Macronovi something about nuclear physics close to the drip lines. And this is one experiment that we have made is we just said, well, all the, the nuclear synthesis action is happening at the drip line. So just as you say, there we have to rely on theoretical models. And one thing that we've done here is we've changed the nuclear mass model. Just take one standard model, this finite range droplet model, replaced it by another standard model, this duflo zucker model. And we have just looked how different does the nuclear synthesis look and how different do the macronovi light curves look. And the nuclear synthesis, depending on how carefully you look, doesn't look that much different. But the heating curves actually differ dramatically because they predict different amounts of um, matter beyond lead. And that stuff decays via alpha decay, which is very efficient in heating the material. And here you see these are the heating rates. And um, you see that these are different trajectories. And you see this one nuclear model produces by about a factor of six more heating than the other standard model. So maybe